thank you all for coming again um, to our panel session this afternoon. Uh, of course, we want to thank all of our sponsors, Creighton, who provided our lunches, the Bible Sciences Department, and the graduate student government, uh, but also the UMC Student Senate and UNL and SUN also provided a lot of the money that helped to make this event possible. Uh, but I'm going to let each of our uh, panelists today introduce themselves. Um, so also, because we're a little bit of a smaller group, feel free to come forward and we can have a, a nice group discussion. So, uh, you guys get started? So I'm Matt Hingis, and um, I'm kind of going to play a dual role because I was originally going to be the moderator. We had a fourth panelist who unfortunately had to drop out due to a family illness. But so um, I'm going to sit in as the fourth panelist as well as uh, kind of getting the discussion started. We have a couple of kind of introductory questions for you to get a chance to know a little bit about all of us. And then we're going to open it up to any questions you have. And our thought about this is that knowing that a lot of folks here are involved in science and research, we've got kind of the dual side of uh, nonprofit work. Um, myself and Cliff at the end, though Cliff more than I, we're not really scientists per se, but we're people who've been heavily involved in nonprofits for quite a while in various capacities. And then the middle, we have Sarah and David, who are both scientists and involved in nonprofit work. And I thought that it'd be kind of fun to have a panel that was a mix of both, so that you could find out what those of us who aren't scientists do, as well as people who are scientists, and kind of get a sense of the interaction as well. So we'll go through, and um, maybe we'll start with Sarah, and I'll go last, and just each introduce ourselves and kind of get a sense of what it is we're doing right now, and then. Um, also, you might as well go into like, a little bit of your background about how you got to where you are today. Hi, my name is Sarah Pasuk, and I'm the supervisor of Reptiles and Amphibians at Nemecula 2 here in Omaha. I started in the zoo world actually through a connection I had with Rick Wright when I was attending. Uh, I thought it would be really fun and amazing to work with the summer, and most people do esoteric testing, so not um, basic testing for the state that's going to be put in. Um, and I'm a chemist there, so I do mass spectrometry, and in that, uh, in that capacity, we do a lot of different things. We do a, a mix of research, a mix of stuff that's already had the research done, and we just kind of redo the benefits of it. And it's, it's pretty uh, broad, I guess, uh, work description there. I started out at a nonprofit after school with the University of Wisconsin. I mean, that's where I first, my first job was University of Wisconsin, which is a very kind of academic heavy, even like the hospital there and stuff, they're all very academic teaching, stuff like that. So in between there and UNMC, I did work at a for-profit laboratory. Uh, and the work is kind of the same, but the goals obviously are very, very different between the two. And it was a much, you know, similar work, but a much different work environment. And I started at UNMC, it's been um, over six years now. and. Yeah, that's kind of so. And now that I'm in that, I kind of don't think I could ever go back to the profit kind of world, there for profit, because uh, it's it's very. We're still even even in my day to day work and the time I've been there, our focus is still academics, learning, continued learning, and things along that line. Um, it's very laid back atmosphere. I get to travel a lot, so it's pretty fun. Um, I kind of just ended up in there. My degrees were in biology and clinical laboratory science, and so you can get a job in a lot of different laboratories. I kind of lucked out at my job at UNMC because uh, you have the hospital there as well, which you know it's similar to the University of Wisconsin, not a profit hospital, a teaching hospital, but uh, the kind of work I do in the university side lab is a lot different. Uh, it's a lot, it's a lot more, a little more science heavy. Uh, it's not definitely like quick turnaround time, just kind of all day, every day doing the same thing. So I'm very lucky I kind of ended up in that job. And uh, it's kind of a grand job. We're funded by the CDC, but not like most research labs you probably hear about where they're constantly kind of writing grants for funding. Our funding is more five to six years at a time. So we don't have that kind of fear uh, of when we're going to have funding for the next year. And the CDC is, is a great like agency to kind of have fund you, so we have to do certain work for them. And beyond that, they're, they're very open. They're like, you do what you can. You know, you can um, do testing, you can charge for it, anything to kind of supplement the money we give you. 
Now, of course, it doesn't go to us. It goes to kind of our group. But like I said, the CDC, just in that aspect, they're very, very kind of nice to work for. And they uh, like help me more than anything. So that's kind of, yeah, that's a little brief description of what I do. Hi, I'm Cliff uh, McAvoy. I'm the executive director of the Buford Foundation. So I'm not in research. Um, I run a nonprofit. Uh, and I've been in nonprofits for the last three years. Um, I started off, I'm from Omaha. Um, I went to St. Louis University. I got my degree in political science and then was in the Air Force for six and a half years. And when I got out, I decided I wanted to get an MPA. So MPA was a lot about government and nonprofits. And after that, I started leaning more towards nonprofits. And since uh, about since I got since I came back to Omaha in 2012, I've been working. Um, did a term of AmeriCorps service, helping veterans in the state. We built a nonprofit program focusing on Omaha and Lincoln and eventually the entire state helping veterans. Um, that was through AmeriCorps. It was also through Lutheran Family Services in Nebraska, uh, Points of Light Institute, and Nebraska Institute of Reform. And then I did some nonprofit development, which is basically the same fundraising. And uh, I did that with Community Services Fund of Nebraska. Um, after that, I got on, I'm also on the board of Nebraska for Civic Reform. And just about 90 days ago, I got this job as the executive director of the Buford Foundation. So I love nonprofits, it's a passion of mine. And even though I don't do research, we use the research that you all do to support our work and our grants. Um, and I'm an avid reader of your research. I don't, wouldn't say I could go out and do it myself. <laughs> but I definitely appreciate when I can find the resources to support the programs that we're building and what we're trying to do. Specifically, the Buford Foundation, we give Omaha girls and boys the gift of confidence. Um, we take them to summer camps where we go through curriculum and uh, um, they do service projects. They uh, go whitewater rafting. They come home to Omaha and the shared experience and the collective impact of everything that they've done in our camps. Um, their attitudes improve, research has shown that they do better in school, they're more likely to go to college. So nonprofits are a lot, it's a pretty good marriage between using some of the research to, to justify and also legitimize our programs and also go out and use that in our, in our search for, our constant search for funding. Um, our constant, uh, as an executive director, I do everything from media relations, community outreach, to implementing a strategic plan, um, and did I say fundraising? Because I do that a lot too. Um, so thank you all for what you do. And let's send it back to Matt. So and I'm Matt Hinkus, and uh, I'm currently the director of grants programs at the Iowa West Foundation. Um, in my background, I've actually worked for the public sector, the private sector, and for nonprofits. So I've gotten a chance to kind of see the various different industries we have from that perspective. Um, I started off working for a small association of cities and for a public entity, which was called the Council of Governments, and then uh, went and got my master's in public administration, and because, you know, one graduate level degree is not enough, of course, I then got a master's in international relations focused on economics and conflict management, um, which means that I can solve anyone's conflicts except my own, uh, which if you ask my girlfriend, she'll tell you it's correct. Then um, from there, I went on to work in international development for a time giving out grants in foreign countries, mostly in Africa and the Middle East. And I now have my position working with the IOS Foundation and again at a nonprofit. And I think that one of the things that I've kind of learned about the process over time is that even though I've worked in different industries, I've done surprisingly similar things in them. But the way that each industry goes about doing that work is very different in some respects. And so working for a nonprofit, you're often working kind of with very limited resources unless you're lucky enough to have some of the longer term kind of funding that David mentioned. Uh, and so I always thought, you know, geez, I uh, was always constantly fundraising and I thought, wouldn't it be better to give out the money rather than ask for it? And so I started working at the foundation and I realized that giving out the money means that more often than not you're saying no rather than yes and you feel like a jerk sometimes. But uh, the way I kind of interact with research in my work is that I'm, I've always set myself up to be a generalist, to be someone who can do management or who can run projects of any kind, kind of regardless of the focus area. And that means that I have to become kind of an instant expert in a lot of different subjects as things happen, learn enough about a subject in order to be able to work with people who are really experts on it and be an informed consumer of what they do. 
And so right now, that expertise is in um, kind of three areas. One is nonprofit capacity building. I work to help identify what the needs for growth are with our particular grantees and help see how we can support them growing and doing their missions more effectively. I work with evaluation, meaning we look at the programs that the nonprofits are doing, and we may have multiple types of programs and approaches in a given area. And the question we're asking is, what is effective from the different approaches that are being used? Is there one approach that is more effective for accomplishing the goals? Others that aren't, or is it a mix? How do we approach things, and how do we learn as a community? How do we ask research questions about the work that we're doing, collect information, and then use that to make decisions? And then the third area is that I cover our um, portfolio of community development programs. So I'm an instant expert in housing and neighborhood work and recreational amenities like trails and parks, all of which I was not an instant expert in a year and a half ago. So that's kind of part of the role is, especially in I think nonprofit world, being flexible and being able to kind of respond to what the needs are if you're on the generalist side or if you're on the expert side, being able to provide enough value that you can kind of help generate resources for the organization in some respects and move the vision forward. So I want to kind of ask one more question and then we're going to open it up to see if there's any questions you guys have because as you see, you have a wide different type of person up here all working in the same industry. Um, and so we're happy to answer any questions. But my kind of final question is, um, did you expect to be on this path that you're on now? And uh, as a follow-up question to it, what piece of advice would you give that you've learned along the way to people who would consider trying to get to a similar place to where you are? Did I expect to be where I am today? Um, yes and no. Um, I've always had a passion for working with animals in some capacity, so it doesn't really surprise me that uh, this career kind of stumbled into my life. Um, but I grew up in North Dakota where I had no concept that zoos like Canada really even existed. I didn't expect to enjoy my job so much. 
we'll say that. I kind of thought at this point it would be an okay, interesting job, but I absolutely love my job. It's very enjoyable. Um, so that's kind of my thoughts on that. And my advice, uh, once I started this job, it's been six years, uh, I kind of made it so my life, um, I realized that I needed to make my life in a way where what I got paid there is enough. And I got to that point. So in the kind of an analogous uh, position of mine, maybe in a regular for-profit hospital or just the hospital in general, you'll get a raise probably every year, every other year. Um, kind of, that's just how it goes. So someone who's been there at the same time as I have in the hospital probably makes more money than me. But and I got to the point where I'm like, I'm okay with that because I enjoy my job so much. So I just had to make it where I'm not going to be a millionaire. I'm not going to be like my surgeon sister. Uh, and then once I kind of understood that and accepted that, I was very comfortable. I live a very comfortable life. I get paid plenty. It's fine. But I realized that, you know, it, it, uh, maybe when I was younger, like when I was 20, I'm thinking, oh, I need to make you know, over $100,000 just to be happy. And that was not the case. So with what I get paid now, it's, 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 everything is very comfortable, but I, I kind of like got myself ready for that and realizing that it's not about me making all the money, it's just about me actually liking my work and kind of putting into that. So that, that's the advice I'd say. Like, get, to, get to a point where you don't need to make all the money in the world. If you can, great, that's fantastic. <laughs> but but if, if, if that is what's keeping you from doing something you really like, like I can't get paid enough, you know, try to make your life so you could work for whatever money that like, something you enjoy is going to give you. It has and, to be quality over quantity. Yeah, and you know, you, every, everyone says that. Everyone hears that. But uh, in the science, we can really kind of say, well, yeah, that's, that's what it is. Because a lot of people that like, they'll be, you know, what, what are you doing that for? That's all, that's all you make and things like that. Be like, yeah, but I'm never really in a bad mood at my job, and when I come home, everything's nice, and I kind of like going to work. So I know those are like things everyone says, it's very cliche, but once you get into the place where you experience it to that point, you really do kind of understand, it's like, oh, this is great, actually, and I'm okay with what I make. So, and then the other suggestion I would say, kind of related to that, said, get, like, pick up as many skills as you can, especially nowadays, because even in my field, um, in where I work, I'm not, you know, I'm not the youngest, I'm not even close to the youngest, but, just something, okay, so we're in laboratory science, but nobody I work with out of the 10 people in my group have what you would even consider like slightly above average computer skills. And you're not, you don't need to. You know, it wasn't expected. But if you go in and you have something like that, and you have another skill like, uh, I don't know, maybe you can write, or maybe you can code, just all kinds of skills that aren't related to what your job is. Like, if you can learn those, learn them. Because that impresses everybody so much, and they realize, oh, we can use you for this as well. Especially at a non-profit place, because if they can get one person who can do three things, not saying they're going to use you, but like they, that makes you that more valuable to them. So they definitely learn everything you can. I'm a student, and I don't think I've ever thought about it, you know, your lab or yeah. what it is. So where are you located, and what exactly is it called? So our lab is called the Nebraska Public Health Lab, and nobody can get to our floor because we do a lot of so my, my specific job for the C is CEC, is chemical terrorism testing. So we do testing, and, and most of this is just, there's one of these in every state. There are one of these in every state. And it's just, uh, it's funded by the um, Homeland Security, basically, where we retain the capacity to test for a lot of chemical weapons, like, like things, you know, nerve agents, and different kinds of poisons and stuff. So. The CDC, I mean, they, uh, is that ever going to happen? We hope not. But the, the fact of the matter is kind of like with government stuff. You know, there's a billion dollars given to the CDC to disseminate those labs. So that's going to happen every year no matter what. So that's kind of our first and foremost function. The CDC is like, you have to be able to do all this stuff for us um, at any time. So that's, and we do work for the FBI and things along those lines. That's why our floor is secured and stuff. But, um, so when it came to advertising that job, it was just advertised as most units in jobs, research technologists, basically, something like that. Then you go there and they talk, and you're like, wow, okay, this sounds really interesting. Um, so, but I know there are some other, maybe just research technologist jobs that if you get there and you work like 
you can get under a good beehive. You can still do kind of similar things. Like the traveling I get to do, that's just what we usually CDC means. And uh, the CDC at this lobbyist organization funds a lot of our travels. So next week I'm going to North Carolina for the week. APHL, Association of Public Health Labs, they, um, they, they award travel scholarships and stuff like that. So yeah, my job is probably, it's a little more, has a little more to it than maybe a basic research technologist job, but it kind of started out in the same, you know, we don't do a whole lot of different work on there. And we also get to work, we, we also got to do a little bit of testing, so that's kind of interesting this year. But yeah, so that's, so yeah, it just be NPHL is kind of like what our lab's called. So you're associated with UNMC, but you're funded through CDC. Yeah, so it's a few things. So CDC gives the money to the state of Nebraska. The state of Nebraska gives the money to UNMC, which isn't really that different, right, because it is a state institution. And so I'm technically a UNMC employee, but, you know, if you had to look for the source of your funding, it, it, it goes to several places first. But yeah, because so, we, we used to wonder a lot about that and what's kind of confusing, but no, we are UNMC employees, just our funding. And that's all they really care about, is like where your funding's going to be here, if they call you an employee or not, but. That's pretty common in the nonprofits having multiple funding uh, sources and uh, having to explain like, well, you know, in a nonprofit, this program is being funded by three different types of grants and, and everything like that. Um, most of the time, we just try and say, you know, we have as diverse a funding stream as possible. Um, especially for a small nonprofit, it's everything from grants to events to, to individual donors. But even uh, the, the Miracle program I did it was um, three different local nonprofits, mm -hmm. along with AmeriCorps and National One, in partnership with Points of Life. And how do you explain that to somebody? Like, how, is the more money seems the better. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Um, no, I did not. In, uh, I did not see myself as the executive director of a nonprofit in December of 2010 when I was a nuclear missile operator in the United States Air Force. So uh, um, when I left the Air Force, I made a promise to myself, which I imagine some of you guys have done, um, that I was going to go back to school for something that interested me, something that I really liked and cared about. And uh, some of my friends were uh, going to law school and uh, they were going into accounting. And I said, well, I'm going to do public administration. Um, and you don't go into public administration thinking you're going to make a lot of money. You go into it because you like it. And the more I, was, uh, more I got involved, the more I was drawn towards nonprofits. For a lot of the reasons that everyone has been saying, um, it, it just uh, feels good at, you know, at the end of every day to wake up and say, like, I'm going to help somebody. I'm gonna, I'm gonna help veterans, or I'm gonna help kids get, find confidence, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna help refugees through their family services get connected to employment services in Omaha. Um, so uh, in December of 2010, I did not uh, expect to be an executive director of a nonprofit, but fast forward eight, five years, I'm not surprised because of the um, uh, strategic jobs and decisions I've made in the last five years. You know, strategically getting a job at, at this nonprofit so I could learn all the different skills that we were talking about. The more skills you know, I should probably learn about nonprofit development so I can do that someday. So I took a job, even though it was a part time job, in, you know, while I was doing another full time job, it was getting those different skills and making myself ready um, because it was a little bit of strategy and it was also a lot of luck. So making those decisions along your path acquire the skills that you need that you need so that when it comes time for the job like, well, I'm, you know, I've never been happier to be an executive director of a youth foundation because I put myself in a position where I'd be ready for that opportunity. Um, which would be uh, I guess the suggestion I would have is um, a lot of networking and volunteering. Uh, you never know you never know who you don't know or what you don't know. Um, uh, You'd be surprised at the doors that can open to you if you just volunteer and say, I will help you put together this panel, or I'll help you, I'll help the Young Professional Summit, the YP Summit in Omaha. And so you can't afford to go to the summit, but you can volunteer, get in the door, and meet everybody, and network. Um, and every, every most of the jobs I've gotten in the last three years have been through volunteering at different community organizations and community services. Um, I met Matt at a flight meeting at working event at seven o'clock in the morning for coffee. And uh, you know, the more uh, the more opportunities.
opportunities that you're so popular, the more people that you get to know. Um, I interviewed for jobs that I knew I wasn't going to get. I mean, I knew I wasn't going to get the job. Because someone told me through my networking, like, oh no, they've already picked someone else for that job. But I still interviewed for that job because I wanted to get to know the organization, I wanted to get to know the people there, and I wanted them to get to know me. And, and the more you do that, the more you get a, a comprehensive uh, landscape of what's out there and what you like to do, because also we never stop learning ourselves. So you find out, well, I would like to do this or that. And I've met this person, and they say good things about this organization. And then you start connecting all those dots. And the next thing you know, you're, you didn't expect to have a job, but you're not surprised that you know, over the accumulated advantages that you accrued, like, oh, hey, this is a really great job, and I love doing this every morning. Like the second is networking thing. That is so important. And like I think the important thing I learned about networking is you might not go anywhere on eighty percent of the people you network with. And but those three percent can be very important. So if it takes meeting eight people or ten people just to get one connection, if you keep at that, that is so worth it. Because I know at first I like ah, I've got networking people. I'm never gonna see them again. So these conferences we go to the C D C everyone from the state goes, we see them once a year. Maybe once every two years, like, no, never mind. But nowadays, with things like LinkedIn and internet, just email in general, and like we have mass emails that are listservs, it's it's so worth it to put that effort in now, I realized. Even if I don't see, even if it's been four years, some people will still be like, oh, email, and you know, you've been associated with certain things, so I remember you. So yeah, I said, definitely keep after the networking part. It's surprising how you network even just a little bit, you realize how very small your part of the world is. Even like in the zoo world, like you go to one conference and the next thing you know everybody from one side of the country to the other. And I ended up in Taiwan last year just through other sea connections. It was it was amazing. But yeah, networking is very, very valuable. And something I'd add to that is, you know, a lot of people are scared of networking because I think we have a misunderstanding about what it really is. It's relationship building. Um, you know, there's the kind of slimy networking that we think about. We go, oh, hi, I'm Matt. How you doing? It's good to meet you. But, I mean, that's not what real networking is. That's not what's going to be helpful to you in your career. But getting to know people who are in your field and understanding them as a person, not necessarily having a specific outcome in meeting them, you'll find that there's a lot of people who you'll end up kind of interacting with that you can be helpful to each other. And I think that's kind of the value of networking. It's interesting that almost all of us have benefited from networking, even when probably many of us at different times have not a networker, or you know, I don't want to do that. Um, my path has been, you know, I'm not cutting it off, yeah, okay. Um, there's two stories to everyone's path, right? There's one looking backwards that you tell everyone that makes it sound like you had it all planned out, and then there's a way it actually happened looking forward where you didn't actually have any clue what you were going to do. So I'll say that story. Um, my very first professional experience, not professional, my very first job, not even a professional job, was uh, I was right out of high school, I had done theater in high school, and I was a squire at medieval times. I got paid minimum wage to wear tights, to fight with a spear, and do backflips on a horse. And the funny thing is that it has nothing to do really with my professional life, but it was the thing that got me my first job, my first real professional job. Because I had been an intern first at the first organization I worked at for four years. And the thing that got me the internship is they saw Squire members and they said, we gotta meet this guy. <laughs> and the only reason they called me in for an interview is because they thought I had something just strange on my resume. And I ended up going and becoming an intern and they really liked me and I liked them too. We got along very well. And then when I left undergrad, my undergraduate institution and I was looking around trying to figure out what I'm gonna do with a political science degree, what do I want to do with my life? And I enjoyed the time I had interned with them. And they called me up and they said, well, you're graduated now, right? I said, yeah. And they said, so you're looking for a job, right? I said, yeah, it's tough. They said, so have you thought about applying to us? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, there's a pregnant pause on the phone. I said, well, why don't you think about it? <laughs> and I said, oh. And I said, well, I don't know if you need some time. I'm not really sure what I want. I'm like, you know, looking back, I'm like, idiot. <laughs> Take the job they're offering you. And eventually I did. And it became a job that defined my entire career path in some ways because I was working with people who worked in local government, and I got to see people who were passionate about serving other people. And that, 
that affected me. And I thought, wow, these guys are so fulfilled by you know the type of work that these guys are describing too. You see it, and you're like, wow, you know they aren't making as much money as they might be able to make in the private sector. In some cases, they're actually doing pretty well because some nonprofit or public institutions pay these money anymore. But seeing that, I'm like, I want that. And so when I left, I went to get my master's in public administration because that's the degree that all these people that I was inspired by had. And then I also had spent a year studying abroad and, and had gotten the travel bug. And so I did a second master's in international relations because I thought, well, certainly two is better than one. Uh, and, and then my next job was in international development. And I had sworn up and down that I was never going to do international development work because I didn't want to. I didn't want to do it. Why would I do international development work? But I was dating a young woman at the time who was from Lebanon. And I was looking at jobs where I could be potentially in the Middle East. And I saw this job opportunity with this organization. And I thought, well, geez, that's not at all what I thought international development was. And it was a job that I was really excited about that allowed me to do service to others, travel, and then do something else that I really liked, which was project management. Because in my first job, I'd done a lot of project management work. I thought, you know, I'm good at this, and I like it, but I can still grow in it. So I'm, I'm certainly not as good as I could be. And so I was looking for those three things, and I saw their national knowledge, I'm like, this, these are the three things. And that girlfriend's cousin worked there. And so I met him at a lot of these parties, and when I was interviewing, he saw me there. He's like, Matt, what are you doing here? I'm like, you know, I didn't know you were you work here. He's like, yeah, no, I, I work here. Are you, are you interviewing him? Like, yeah, I was having I got the job because he put in a good word for me, because he knew me. Well, so then I got that job. And then as I started to look for the job out here, you know, I, I had a more refined understanding of kind of what I wanted and was able to tell my story better. And I did it without networking to get into this job. And yet that's still part of the process, right? Because it's the skills you have, the, the relationships you've made, that when they're checking your references, those are the things that they check, or the relationships you have with the people. So if I had a piece of advice, now looking backwards, for myself when I was younger, or for anyone else who cares, um, I think there's this interesting thing, there's, I love TED Talks. There's a TED Talk by a woman named Priya Parker. She talks about FOMO and FOBO. FOMO is fear of missing out, and FOBO is fear of better opportunities. And especially for millennials, and I, I get to count myself as one of the former I don't trust. Uh, especially for millennials, it's something that a lot of us deal with, and it's that kind of feeling that I had when I was still telling people, oh yeah, I haven't thought about working with you. I was suddenly trained in some respects, with just an undergraduate degree, but trained to do something, and yet I had all these options that were open to me. And I felt like I was standing in a hallway with all these different doors, and I knew that I only got to open one door, and it was terrifying. So what if I opened the wrong door? I'll never get to open another door in my life. If I open the one wrong door, it's gonna destroy the rest of my life. And the reality is, is that that's not at all the case. You open a door, and you're in a new hallway with a bunch of doors. And I think what you can see from a lot of our stories here is that we didn't have a direct path to doing something we liked, but I think we all are doing something we care about now, and we're all happy with where we got to. We got there because we made a series of decisions along the way, and no one decision led to all of it. It's that desire to keep looking back and thinking, okay, what have I learned since I made my last decision, and how will I make my next decision differently because of what I learned? So, we've talked for a little bit now, and you have a sense of kind of who we are and what our path has been. Let's open it up to any questions you guys have that you want us to answer, for either all of us or any of us specifically. Well, um, so what I'm thinking is, actually, so all of you, um, I'm a PhD student, and I don't know, I don't even know that our organization like you always thinks that's it. So my question is, how is it that, you know, we should be aware of like, I'm happy and glad that, you know, I came in here and I was able to, you know, hear about you, all of you. But for a person, like, who's not aware of these things, like, do we have to make that effort ourselves, like, to be made aware of something? Or how do we come across this? Like, you know, there's something like this that exists. Right. Well, for one thing, you're in this room today, you know, listening to us, and, and so you, you, you uh, made a point to come and learn about something new. And then it's also holding on us. I mean, it's part of my job to make sure that people know about us. There's a reason why I'm here talking about what we do and giving back and talking about you know how uh, nonprofits and research can help each other out. Um, and just talking about groups in general. So you know, it's a it's kind of a 
Uh, if you want to know about this type of stuff, um, like I go to community events that I'm, I don't necessarily, I'm not an expert in, let's say, wind energy at OPPD, but I'll go to um, open OPPD board meetings, or I'll go to uh, open um, the Chamber of Commerce as a YP and professional council, and they have open meetings. Um, I mentioned it before, you can learn a lot and go get in through a lot of doors just by calling people up and saying, do you need any help? You know, uh, um, do you want to volunteer? A lot of, a lot of nonprofits, we, uh, and you mentioned it, networking. I like you said it better when, when you said just helping each other out. Like we all have to help each other out because you're doing more with less, or maybe you're doing everything with nothing. <laughs> or uh, a friend of mine said you're, you're building the car as you're driving it down the road. And honestly, uh, I've never really done anything by myself. You always have to uh, uh, reach out and get help from everyone else. And so, um, you know, I'm constantly, like, not through networking, but just through going out, being a part of other organizations and, and uh, helping them out when, when they need help. Um, maybe at a ratio of five to one, I help five other organizations. So when, when I need help in my organization, one of those people will come and also help me. And so you're, you're constantly getting to know each other. And uh, I'm, maybe it's just me, but I'm paranoid that I don't know something. <laughs> so I'm constantly listening to TED Talks or Radio Lab or, or just NPR in general. Uh, because you, you never know like that, that organization that could help you out, or that person that knows someone that can make a connection for you. Um, so I mean, just by the sheer fact that you're here today means that you're interested in getting to know, know something like nonprofits or, or uh, here at the career fair. Um, and it's also on our part as well to make sure that people, that we're out there as much as we can be so that people like you get to know us and what we're doing. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I would just add that there's some, you know, if, especially if you want to learn about different organizations in a particular field, there's aggregation points that happen from professional associations sometimes where people come together from a lot of similar types of organizations. So if you know you're interested in youth services, for example, there may be a group of youth services organizations that come together and you can kind of see who their membership is. And it's a it's a point, a focal point for that particular area. Um, I would say for nonprofits in general, you have Omaha Gives, which is run through the Omaha Community Foundation. And it's a way that they all come together to fundraise together at one particular point. And their goal is to get information out and hopefully funding back for the purpose of their organization. And so there's a few different Places like that, and if you are you're interested in nonprofits specifically, uh, nonprofit association of Midlands, it's a really good organization of about 400 uh, Omaha, Lincoln, and, and Iowa nonprofits. Yep. Um, foundations are another good aggregator. Yeah, if you go to the Iowa West Foundation website, you can see all the different organizations we funded, and so our areas we fund them are economic growth, education, place making or community development, and human and social needs or healthy families. So. If you look at our past grants, you can see 20 years of funding organizations in the geographic area in those sub in those subject areas. And specifically in Omaha, if you are interested in some organizations to join, this uh, Opus is Omaha Professionals United in Service. Um, Omaha Venture Group is another group uh, of Omaha professionals that uh, pick three nonprofits every year. Um, they interview them, or actually. They interview nonprofits and they pick three every year. Um, there's an organization called 100 Women Giving Back in Omaha. It's a new one. Um, I'm trying to think of any others. In Washington, D.C., they used to have an organization, that, and there was an affiliate here. I don't know if it's still around or not. But it's called Catalog for Philanthropy. And it was similar to the venture group approach where they would go and they would review nonprofits and kind of recommend that if you want to fund a really great nonprofit in uh, something, then they reviewed it and they found that this nonprofit is the top of their list kind of as a proxy for, you know, the research that we don't all have time to do for the giving that we do. No, because I, I had the same question you did. And so I think something to keep in mind is a lot of these groups, uh, you know, they're, they're just ran by humans. So they might not also understand or they might not think, you know what, we're not advertising all that. For people to know, you know, we, we put our stuff on CareerLink, but I mean, how many, you know, CareerLink, I think a lot of us think CareerLink are maybe either part-time or maybe
maybe not a hardcore science job. Like, oh, I'm not going to find a hardcore science job on Career Lake. So, like a lot, and the, the, the organizations that you've heard of, they're good, right? They're good at getting their name out. There's so many other organizations, they don't even think about that problem. So when they talk to someone, someone's like, I've never heard of your organization. You'd hope they'd be like, oh, well, we need to change that. Because I've had so many places, I'm like, I didn't know who you guys existed. In retrospect, you're like, oh, it makes sense because the job you do needs to be done, but I never thought about that there's an actual physical organization with people there. And just from, okay, you guys mentioned like, like all the information you get, you know, Radio Lab, NPR, reading the newspaper, which I know is boring, but you do that enough, once you pick your geographic area and you think about, for starters anyway, just the more you, you take in knowledge, you hear about these things. You might hear it like in one paragraph, and you're like, oh, what's that? I never heard about that. So, you know, the Sierra Club, I know a lot of people heard about that, but I never heard of the Sierra Club until I kind of got into my, the master's degree program, and just something like that, I just happened to hear about it. I'm like, oh, okay, so let me start learning about it. So I guess the point is that not every, like, even with the internet, not everyone is as good as getting their name out there. So, you know, is the answer you're supposed to work harder and look for them? We hope you be able to find like a happy medium where they get their name out well enough and you look well enough and then you can find them. But I totally understand because I've met so many places I just had no clue they existed. And I feel like kind of weird that I didn't know they existed. But there's just a lot of just, I mean, especially in today's social media world, there's a lot of competition amongst um, different organizations out there. I mean, it's so easy to get lost amongst the multitude that there is, and I think it just kind of goes back to networking. You just find, you know, institutions, organizations, whatever that look interesting, and you start volunteering, you're an intern, whatever, and through that, you know, you constantly, we get really wrapped up in our own lives and our own goals and directives, but at the same time that you're focusing on your own goals, you also have to keep the periphery in mind. What are other people talking about? What's that organization that you say we're helping with now? And, you know, to think of um, the world much broader terms sometimes, and you will, you'll learn about a lot more other opportunities that way. Like that said, you'll open the door and find 50 more in the next hallway. I, I have one last question, and I'll leave you open for it. Um, so if I were to communicate to any one of you, is it considered rude, or like, I can reach out to anyone in the organization and ask for some information, or a job, or anything? Well, so it depends. If you're looking at an organization that has, you know, bigger organizations are going to be different culturally than smaller organizations. I would, I'm a big advocate for doing informational interviews that if you're trying to explore a career path and to talk to people who are in the field. And the best people to talk to are people who you have a connection to already. And understanding kind of through your schools, you can look at the alumni network and you, you have a lot of other kind of networks that you're a part of. But I have actually written before to somebody who has never met me, who I have no connection to. Her name is Caroline Brown, and she's lovely. And I said, hi, we haven't met yet, but you're doing a career path that I think is really interesting, and I'm trying to reorient my career to do something very similar. Would you have 20 minutes where you could sit and talk to me, and we could, I could learn more about how you got to where you are and what it is that you do, because I see a lot of value in it. And she said, yeah, I'd love to. And she gave me some great advice, and so then later when I finally got the job I was looking for, I wrote back to her and said, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Your advice really helped me, and here's how. And so, you know, that's a process where a lot of people are willing to share their time with you if you ask for it. But one of the kind of cultural and uh, rules of information interviews is you should never ask for a job. Because it's, it's considered to be impolite in that context. Um, a lot of workers, sometimes people will proactively tell you about a job, but as the person asking for the interview, you're not supposed to. I think with that, it's a lovely letter um, that you wrote. Because we're so geared up on, you know, quick, instant information, if you actually handwrite a letter like that, it will have much huger impact than just a random email in somebody's inbox. Yeah, I've done some things in that, that I've, I've shashanked people, where I sent a I sent my resume to the same organization that I was trying to get to know. I sent it to them every Monday for uh, about six weeks in a row until they finally emailed me back and recognized the fact that I was trying to contact them. And they said, oh, okay, we have your resume. We're gonna put it on, we're gonna put it on file for six months. So then I, put, I set a calendar date for six months from then to follow back up. Um, I don't know, but, you know. Um, I've sent the random, uh, uh, 
or sent the letters to friends, but it's also, and I used to work with veterans a lot, and I used to tell them, people aren't gonna be able to help you if you if they don't know what you're interested in or what you're doing, you know, especially if you're looking for a job. Um, even you start with your friends and family, like people don't know you're looking for a job or don't know what you want to do or what you're interested in, then how are they gonna be able to help you and uh, make connections for you or, or, or do everything that it's gonna take? Because um, it's a lot of, it is a lot of luck, but it's also a lot of hard work, and you're never not working, you're never not networking, you're never not helping out, you're never not making those connections, you never know how it's going to come back and, and uh, help you find the job that you're looking for. But I, I used to tell veterans all the time, if you want, if you're looking for a job, tell them, tell that person, like, hey, I'm interested in a job, because how are they going to know? Because they can't read your mind. <laughs> and I think the. Uh, uh, way to approach some of your family and friends, you know, I think mean, about Facebook, right? You can create separate groups within Facebook where you can be sending out people that you know and trust information that, hey, I'm looking right now for this, this, and this. Is there anyone that you would recommend? You can kind of get the broadcast more broadly that way. Something you might not send out to everyone you know, but to your friends and family. And I know people who've had a lot of success starting to build networks based on reaching out to their family and friends first. Um, but I personally think LinkedIn is a great way to do it. Um, you know, you have to be, I try to keep only LinkedIn connections to the people that I know and that I could then say, if somebody comes to me and says, hey, you're connected to this person, I would like to connect to that person, then I can say, okay, yeah, I know that person well enough that I know that they'll accept if I ask them to talk to you. Right, and the, best, the best way to, if someone can make an introduction for you and kind of have that referral and say, so you, you talk to someone and, they, and you know they know someone that you're trying to get a hold of, ask them to make an introduction, that could be a simple email. Yeah. Have someone do that vouch for you and say, hey, you know, so and so's friend of mine is interested in this type of career field. Um, and then I can't tell you, I drink a lot of coffee, mostly because I like it, but also because half of my meetings are like, hey, let's, let's go grab coffee and talk. Um, and I mean, I see him at the coffee shops, so I know it's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, luckily I like coffee. But, and, and so many people have helped me out. I uh, can't tell you, I mean, can you begin to count how many people helped me out along the way? Like if you were interested in something and you reached out to me, I am more than happy to help out because, I mean, how else am I going to pay it forward and get back to like all the people that had coffee with me and given me advice over the years? You know, I would love if I'm ever if I'm in a position where I actually can, can uh, pull other people out. I mean, to answer your like your original question, is it rude to reach out? I would say never. Not would be rude. At the same time, the flip side to the the edge of that sword is sometimes you have to get used to rejection because. Uh, yeah. I've been told no a lot, <laughs> or maybe I've come on too strong at, at a at an event like corner first, like hey, I always wanted to meet you, like hey, or, you know, I mean, yeah, sometimes you have to use rejection. A lot, you write a lot of grants, don't get accepted. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, every rejected grant was another lesson I learned, or every person that I, you know, there were people that I didn't get to meet up with, but late, you know, a year later we were in the similar circle, so we did get to finally connect. So. Rejection is kind of happens more frequently than. Mr. Yeah. You mentioned about a lot of tips on how to build the network. But another question is how to maintain the network. For example, I have the one year that I had before I went for the job, and I got some connection now in the meeting, for example. And maybe after one year, they already forget who I am. <laughs> so how to maintain that? Do you have any suggestions? You mentioned thank you notes. Yeah, the section notes, it's just after that, yeah. still put next. Well, I think especially if somebody has given you a piece of advice, when you use it, which is probably going to be a few weeks or even a month after you've got it, then reaching back out and explaining that that had an impact is a good time to do it. But I think it's also important to realize that you're right. You can't effectively maintain the types of networks that technology allows us to have, not as real relationships. And that's okay, because if you haven't talked to someone in a year, you're probably not going to really have a relationship with them. And so having strong relationships with fewer people is more important than having a large list of contacts on LinkedIn. And there, are, there are key people I, well, I consider my mentors that I have breakfast with like every three to six months. And there are people that I had breakfast with when I you know, first moved home, and a year later, like, hey, it's been a year, we want to get back together. And, but there, but once again, there are probably a lot more people that I could maintain those relationships with. But the ones that really affected me, or uh, like my mentors, I make a point to uh, follow up with them at least every three to six months. Yeah. So, 
so us in the sciences, what's our big way to do that? Conferences. You go to conferences. So if you if you get in a field, whether it's a yearly conference, and I have some that are uh, very two years, but you know, okay, you know most likely you're gonna see these people there. And so when you're there, you really gotta like you know, I might say go for broke, but you really need to, if you want to meet people, you need to go meet these people. And like I said, don't don't over come overpower and overbearing. But uh, just do it so they remember you and then between those listservs, and this really depends on what kind of field you're in. So we have a lot of listservs, CDC listserv, uh, a plasma chemistry listserv I'm on, and it's daily. People are posting stuff. And the, the cool thing about the uh, plasma chem listserv is you are required to put a, a uh, like signature on there, who you are, where you're from. So after a while, you get these people down. You know where they are. You know what school they work at, or what, what institutions they work for. Yeah, what questions they're asking. And, uh, and th there is a guy at this EDC, he, uh, I mean, that's his hobby, is just answering questions on this listserv. So he, he could probably rub some people the wrong way because they're like, oh, you're just in everything. But more people are like, oh, and I, I, I know this guy, so I've been with him and he's met people, and they're like, oh, I know you by your name, and like, I'm so happy to meet you now. So, but that is, that is a certain mechanism that if you're in the science field and you can go through those things, great, because it's almost guaranteed that you know these people are going to be there. They're there to network as well, so they're not just there to kill time and you know, against their will. But that, that's one advantage I think we have in the science field is just that, that extensive it, kind of almost yearly meeting and stuff like that. So definitely take advantage of those. I know they can be really rough to go to a mode a lot of times, especially really big ones, but like if you're there and you know, you can find one person you know from previous one, that's a start, and you just build from there, I think. So that's probably the best way I've been able to maintain these relationships, because I don't see them very often, but we talk, you know, or else we email, or else we work on a problem together, and then when the conference comes up, we sit next to each other, and we go out and we have drinks and stuff, so it's, it's just, you know, maintaining that effort, but it, it is, like I said, it's, it's kind of given to me in that one, in that field. I mean, it would be different if I was in something where I had to go make a special trip to go see someone. That probably would not last, that kind of relationship or connection. So functions very much the same way. I found what's very helpful is, once you've been in your field or your uh, job for a while, capitalize on your boss's connections yeah. to begin with. I mean, if you you know you know such and such institution is working with so and so, and you talk to your boss, maybe he knows somebody, maybe he can always make an introduction for you and make it a lot easier. Um, then also within whatever organization you might be part of, volunteering for those little things that are above and beyond your normal job duties. That gets your job and your name out there. Um, in the zoo world, I manage uh, two populations across the country of uh, turtle species. So this is something I have to do. It's just adds more work to my already full plate of, of things I need to get done. Um, but not because I'm managing these, these species. You know, people that want to work with these turtles, they have to come to me and talk to me. And I have to tell them which the turtles are not. I have to listen. Um, but volunteering for those things where if you have the opportunity to um, uh, take management type courses in the zoo world offers a lot of them. You know, getting out there and meeting the instructors people that have been there in the, the industry for a while and meeting other people that are kind of at your same point in the career path. That again helps you make those connections and build those connections. And maybe I don't talk to these people more than once a year, but you know, I can email them, hey, so and so, we met last year at such a conference, it was a great time, hope things are going well with whatever I remember from them. Um, have a quick question for you about alligators, whatever. Um, and you'll find, I would hope, in the nonprofit world, that because we are so dependent on the help of others, most people are going to help. And they're in the same boat. That's that's something I, I always thought. Oh, I'm only one here who doesn't know yeah. anybody. And then I realized, no, there are like a thousand other people here who came along and don't yeah. know anybody. So there are everyone. There are everyone else in the same boat, unless they are super charismatic. Like they're they're going to be. Oh man, I want to keep in touch with that person. I don't know how. Should I email them? Would that be weird? So that's something I once I started realizing, we're not alone. Or right. people who are thinking the exact same thing you are. The flip side of that is, at one, some point you might walk into a, a room where you do know a lot of people and your natural inclination is to go hang out with, go talk to people that you know. And I always have to say, I always say hi to them, I'll make a point to go introduce myself and meet someone I don't know to keep, keep the process going. And I also just thought of another organization you might be interested in, it's the Nebraska Business Ethics Alliance. 
they, they bring nonprofits and corporations in uh, Nebraska together for, uh, like, I think it's monthly or quarterly luncheons, networking events. So keeping an eye on the time, I think we can do one more question, if there is one more question out there.
um, constant evaluation of our programs and, and showing our funders and our and making sure if I'm giving kids if our, the purpose of my foundation is to give kids the gift of confidence, you know, how do I prove that? You know, make evaluating and making sure our programs are in place and creating the systems to, so that if something goes wrong, we can we can fix it. And plus, you know, we're organizations of people at any given time, something somebody can make a mistake, something can go wrong. So there's always that pressure, like what's what's going to happen that I'm not seeing. Something and I'm going to have to deal with it, but mitigating that risk proactively so that you don't have to just react to the crisis and making sure that there's a system in place that everybody knows what to do if something happens. So a lot of pressures of any any organization or company, but it's always nonprofits where it's you know, less, and less money. And, and, and also nonprofits, everyone knows what your overhead is or, or there's a constant, you know, most of the percentage of all money you get has to go straight to program. And I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily the right way to do it. There's a good TED talk uh, saying that we should act more like businesses and plus like nonprofits. Um, and make the pie bigger as opposed to a smaller slice of a smaller pie. Uh, but anyways, um, there's a yeah. gap. So even though we're like, you know, we work for nonprofits, a lot of times people giving us the money are definitely profit places. So they yeah. really care what their money gives them out of that. So that's kind of just the pressure is always there. Well, uh, I want to thank you guys for taking time to listen to us and for asking some good questions. And thank you guys for volunteering to come and speak today and uh, check the waitresses.